is September the 14th, a Wednesday in Glen Eyre in Cary, North Carolina. We are following up on the historical project of the Library of Congress to interview veterans. And we have many veterans here at our retirement community. And today we have Fred Jerome to talk to us. And I'm going to ask Fred some questions and let him tell us about his service. Fred, would you tell us your name and where you were born right. and reared? My name is Fred D. Jerome. I was born in Clayton, North Carolina, but I lived in Pittsburgh all my life, Pittsburgh, North Carolina, oh. which is very near here. Town. And uh, then moved to Raleigh when I graduated from NC State University and been living in Raleigh ever since. I'm now living in the Glen Eyre Retirement Community in Cary, uh, along with these good people here, and it's a very, very nice place. And anyone that wants to come join us is welcome to come. <laughs> we have today, we have Pete Holland as our cameraman, and we have John Sloan who instigated this, and I'm Helen Leverton, and we are interested in keeping this history alive. So tell us how you happened to get into the service. Well, I was going, this was in 1943, and I could see the handwriting on the wall about going to be drafted. Mm -hmm. So I decided that I didn't want to walk, so <laughs> I joined the Navy. <laughs> and, and just before being drafted, it wasn't too long before I would have been. So I escaped the foot soldier and went into the Navy. And actually, my family had a Navy background, so that suited me. My uncle was a retired captain in the Navy, and a lot of my first cousins were in the Navy, so it was logical that I followed in their footsteps. And my two brothers also joined the Navy. They're younger than I. That kept, a, kept it in the family. It yes, it did. Good decision. Yes, it did. So, Particularly since I didn't want to walk. <laughs> so you entered, you joined the Navy by well, going see. to a, All right. a recruiting. I was in, um, no, I was in um, uh, State College Engineering School, Electrical Engineering. And I got in the Navy V 12 program. And this was in uh, 1943. And in July of 43, I was sent to the um, Navy V-12 unit at Charlottesville, Virginia, at the University of Virginia. I remained there until March of 1944. But the, the V-12 unit was a place where the Navy uh, stacked and uh, kept in reserve a large number of college students that could then be pulled out and sent to midshipman school to be commissioned in the Navy. And in um, March of 1944, they sent me to midshipman school at the University of Columbia in New York. Now actually I was in the um, engineering branch. So they put all the engineers on an old decommissioned battleship anchored in the hmm. river. Yeah. It was on the bottom, couldn't float. <laughs> they had stripped everything off of the uh, main deck and covered it, and it looked like a big barn sitting out in the middle of the river. <laughs> and there we were. We, now I'm supposed to be an engineering <laughs> student, graduate. But actually most of our three months, two of that was about naval etiquette. And as you know, or you might not know, the Navy is hell on etiquette. They did relax some of the rules during the war, but they did have etiquette. So I knew all about naval etiquette, but not a great deal about engineering. You see, we didn't have it, and I was supposed to be down in the engine room. And we didn't have any engine room. And the books that we looked at, some of them were way out of date. They had reciprocating engines shown in there. 
<laughs> so it was mostly on-the-job training after you got out of membership in school. So anyway, after three months, I was commissioned as an ensign in the United States Navy. I was issued $150 to buy uniforms with. They had, uh, we didn't have to have a sword at that time, but, um, and we didn't have to wh have whites. We had uh, blues and grays, gray uniforms. At the time that I, um, one of the things we learned was that when you reported aboard a, a duty station, that you presented your calling card to the executive officer, who then made an appointment with you to see the captain, commander. So I bought a hundred calling cards. What did I know? So when I reported to board duty the first time, the executive officer, well, he did, he tore it up, said, you don't need that. So I still have 99 calling cards left. <laughs> oh, no, too bad, too bad. Too no, bad. it was all right. That was Why fine. Why did you go chop? Well, I, I, I was. Uh, well, they had uh, people come aboard. Hart Schaefer and Marks, mm -hmm. uniform um, makers, for the for the Navy then at that point, and we got a hundred fifty dollar allowance, and as I remember, that purchased everything that we needed. Mm -hmm. uh, I was um, commissioned in June of 1944, came home for a few days, and then left for the West Coast. And that was a horrible trip. The... Uh, Bucket seats on the airplane. There were no <laughs> seats, no airplanes. Oh gosh, no. We had to go by train, train of course, oh, yeah. independently. And I believe, as I remember, they paid us three cents a mile. Well, I paid my own way but got reimbursed at the rate of three cents a mile. And my Padam allowance, I believe, uh, was seven dollars a day. Mm -hmm. well, that's pretty good, back in those days. I had money to burn. I then reported uh, in um, San Pedro, uh, California, uh, after two to three days leave at home, I was then 21 years age. I was a, a Vincent. I knew all about the engine rooms, having never been in one. But by the grace of uh, the Navy, when you are commissioned an officer, you expected to know what you, uh, you have been commissioned as an engine and engineer, and you should know it. So, we were waiting in uh, San Pedro for about six months, four months, five months, for the ship to be commissioned. Oh, that was wonderful. Go into Los Angeles every night, have a glorious time. It was wonderful. Best duty I ever had. Well, we met movie stars and all the canteens, the Palladium, we went to the Palladium, had a picture taken. I was 21 years old, Helen. Made all of $150 a month. Had money and to I had blow money away. to blow away. I couldn't ask for any better thing. Now, after that, in November of 44, the ship was put in commission. Now, this was an attack transport. It's the APA 127. And if you're not if you're not familiar with an attack transport, what it does is carry um, troops to a landing zone, and we had 26 little boats on, the, well, the not so little boats on this ship, and you would load the troops in this uh, landed boat, and they would go ashore uh, for the a, a battle that was uh, where they were loaded. Uh, we had it, the the boat was ship was about 455 feet long and 60 feet wide, so it wasn't very small. And, and we would the, the name of it? USS Allendale, the APA-127. 
It was named for a county in South Carolina, and they had mm -hmm. promised that they would send us a silver service, mm -hmm. you know, in honor mm -hmm. of the name, but we never got it. But I don't know what we would have done with the silver service anyway. That was an old custom in the Navy. I know they had them in the past. Yeah, but I think they forgot us, which is just as well. Um, now, Fred, while you had that wonderful time near Los Angeles, you were aboard ship during the day. No. Did you, did you see an engine no, room? No, no, the ship was not put in commission for four or five months. So you couldn't go into the engine room? And we didn't have an engine room. The ship was being built. <laughs> so, uh, and it wasn't until November of 44 that, that we mm -hmm. went aboard, and at which time I was initiated into the mysteries okay. of the engineer of uh, engine room. Uh, we would, uh, the, the ship would carry, <clears throat> as I said, 26 small landing craft. And uh, we had about 480 personnel, listed personnel, and 50, 60 officers. Uh, we got pretty, pretty proficient at loading and unloading the boats, little boats. We, could, we unloaded them, all of them in 26 minutes, uh, 13 minutes, which is pretty good when you think they all had 26 of them that we had to load, unload one right after the other. So we were pretty efficient. We were all green, but we learned very fast, and that's very fortunate. And it didn't take us long to learn what was going on and how to uh, conduct ourselves, a constant training. So where did they send you? Well. From this November time period. All right. Well, after shakedown cruise, mm -hmm. with finding out how everything worked and uh, where all the valves were and which one you turn when you're <laughs> not supposed to, we then went to uh, Pearl Harbor. There was some more training in Pearl Harbor, islands around uh, there. Loaded up with our combat load. Our, a normal combat load were 15, 1,600 combat-ready troops, and with their equipment, tanks, largely uh, whatever they needed, these particular groups needed. And we headed out for the Western Pacific to Leyte, and then assembled uh, for the invasion in Okinawa. So we were in the invasion of Okinawa, and we were there for about eight days, unloading and moving, and it was, at that time, the kamikaze um, airplanes came over all the time. I guess we spent more time in general quarters than we did in anything else, but we claim that we shot down a plane. I don't know. I, my battle station was in the central uh, damage control. So I didn't know what was going on outside except what I could hear over the sound phone. <coughs> but I kept a good ear for what was going on. Anyway, we were there for about eight days, moving in and out, unloading. We left there and then made repeated trips across the ocean to the mainland and then back again. We, during the time the ship was in commission, which was about 16 months, we traveled 73,000 miles and were 245 days at sea. So we were back and forth across the Pacific at, at, after the war was over. Well, we had well, several times, two times we went to Japan with um, loads of occupation troops. I went to see Hiroshima went out in and looked at see the devastation. We had been warned beforehand not to pick up anything that was metallic because of radiation. Of course, we didn't know what we, they were talking about. No one did at that mm -hmm. time. Yeah. Anyway, I remember one time 
in, in Hiroshima, we met this German priest on a bicycle. And he was the only one that we that he could speak English, he could speak some English, so we got to talk to him about that. But he was very interested. And I don't know why a German priest was in Japan, but anyway, he was there. We made, I, then after the war, <clears throat> when we came back to the States, after uh, Okinawa, we were going to load up for the invasion of Japan. And um, about that time, uh, the war was over, so that was canceled, and we went into dry dock. And our holds of the ship where normally we were carrying cargo were converted into um, double-decker bunks for troops. So we made repeated trips across the ocean to bring back the personnel back to mm. the U.S. Mm -hmm. As I said, we spent 245 days at sea. Now most of that time was very boring because there's nothing to do at sea. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't any, well, we were really glad whenever we pulled into port. But a lot of the ports that we pulled into were nothing but an island, no trees, uh, sand, so why go ashore? Nothing to see. Did the men swim? Did you jump Oh yeah, the we ship jump all swim? off the boat and, and swim. That was and that was the really boat. about the only recreation we really had in. Mm -hmm. <coughs> These trips across the ocean during the war, say after Okinawa, was it to pick up more troops yeah. at, at, on the mainland? On the mainland to carry them back to, um, for the invasion of Japan. We were scheduled for that. But fortunately the war was over at that time and the rest of the time we spent hauling troops around from place to place and uh, they called it the magic carpet at that time in which mm -hmm. they were bringing all of the uh, discharged servicemen home to be discharged. But um, we were de commissioned in Norfolk in May of 45, no, 46. Mm -hmm. And I entered my final year at uh, State College, NC State University, in September of that year and finished uh, the following June. That's when you really so, learned about your engineering. You that's when I got finished learning more, about the engineering. You got some more you know, but, education but, but in that the, field. The really, when I stop and think about it, and I've often thought about it, how green most of the men were, but how quickly we learned. You know, it was. I remember when I reported aboard, I, I went down and traced out every pipe, every valve, I knew, so that I knew exactly, I did this first, so I knew exactly where everything was in case I needed to know. But at that time, I was only 20 years old. Uh, Do you think you had older seamen, the chief petty officers I've heard were the men who really taught Told oh, you yes. everything you needed to know in the Navy. No, I didn't teach everything they needed to know because some of them... But they, they were the old times, yes, weren't they? Yes, yes. But we didn't have many of them, mm. you see. Just a sprinkling of the uh, seasoned Experience, personnel. Yeah. And, but we learned very, very fast. And I, I've often thought about that and how, uh, how we all came together and did a job that we had to do. And everything worked out very good for us. Well, you were doing what this, the nation had called on you to do. You were serving yeah. your country at a time of need. Yes, that's true. That's true. And you all, you knew you were doing your duty. And you you yeah. knew you were helping the war effort. <clears throat> so did you but, come home and um, continue studying and then later yes, on you I, went? Yes, and my, yeah, I finished my final year after the um, service and graduated in Started to work as a civilian. 
with the company and stayed with them a long time? Oh, yes. You stayed with them? I started with the Carolina Power Light Company, the old Carolina Power Light Company, and finished with them, retired in 1986. Thoroughly enjoyed my time, and thoroughly enjoyed my time, retirement time. <laughs> I have two daughters and ten grandchildren, so they keep me busy. And you give a lot of your time to the community. We've seen you and how much you do. Well, no, I, I don't know that I've given a lot of time to community. Yes, you do. I'm, I'm getting lazy and lazy, Helena. Fred I'm, has a golf cart of which he's very proud, and he gives our residents trips around the place to yes, see what's going on. Yes, we do. We do. We enjoy You're it. You're still a navigator. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I didn't navigate. You know, we were in several storms during that time, but when you were in the engine room, in emotion, is not nearly as bad as the motion way up here. Oh. So, so you're relatively uh, you don't tend free. to get seasick. I was not seasick the whole time. A lot of people were, but I was not. Would you recommend that uh, line of work to people going into service nowadays, over and above, say, instead of the Army? or? Well, I have no experience with the Army, but I would certainly recommend it. But you see, the difference is between my experience, which was three months of learning Naval etiquette, and the Naval Academy's experience of four years, mm -hmm. where they learn all of these things as a matter of course. So all of them, when they graduate, have really an engineering degree in addition to whatever uh, the... Um, uh, the deck personnel yeah. normally would uh, like navigation. See, I didn't have any navigation. Mm -hmm. I'd be completely lost on the ocean. Mm -hmm. But they would be, well, some of them would have been lost in the engine room, so that worked out. <laughs> of course. They were specialists in all fields. Yeah, you, the, you we, were, we were very specialized then, as far as that. You follow part. your specialty. Yeah. Uh, but, of course, the naval graduates now have to know all of that. I mean, they are... They are uh, they are very familiar with engineering and the navigations and whatever they. It's a wide range we call them of deck apes, Helen. Deck what? Deck apes, and we were the black uh, gang, and there was constantly rivalry between the two. Uh -huh. Would there have been sports organized to keep you all busy or occupied? I mean, any kind Work. of. Oh, well... Uh, competitions of any kind? You mean between the various... No, the not groups. really. We crossed the equator f three or four times. Well, did you have the Neptune But we, we didn't have the uh, initiation ceremonies. You didn't? No. I don't remember now why we didn't. I have movies of those. Do you? They're ridiculous. But you see, when, when <clears throat> we had troops aboard, which was most of the time, it was very crowded. Mm -hmm. And you were never really free of people because in the tropics we we did not have air conditioning mm -hmm. and it was very hot inside and of course during the war times you had blackouts at night time and all the uh, portholes were closed, no smoking on deck etc. and so forth. And of course when we were, did not have personnel aboard Army personnel or Marine, we would sleep on deck as much as possible. To be cooler. To be cooler. Mm -hmm. But of course with all the soldiers, uh, they also were on the deck and we didn't have any place to sleep. <laughs> anyway, well, how did the we were all delighted when we got rid of them. <laughs> The food situation, was it usually pretty good? Yes, Did they it was very good. I don't know how the we, 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 of course, we had powdered eggs and powdered milk, which is, you know, it's all right. But the first thing we did when they pulled in the port, when we get fresh milk, mm -hmm. oh, that was so wonderful to drink fresh milk and fresh vegetables. But as I said, we steamed 73,000 miles back and forth and 245 days out of that total commission was spent at sea, moving. So we moved back and forth across the Pacific. 
and the only actual battle that we were in was it at Okinawa. And, and the engines held up and the, no, the ship fact, was in good shape. Oh yeah, but as a matter of fact, we had problems with the ship. But coming back from one time into San Francisco, we had a very violent vibration in the propeller shaft. So we had to proceed at slow speeds and when we finally got back to San Francisco, they had to go into dry dock to have the propeller shaft changed. Mm -hmm. So we had some mechanical problems, but not many. One of the things that astonished, no, I don't say that, but mail, it has constantly amazed me that wherever we would pull into a port, wherever, we would have a, stock, a stack of mail waiting for us. They knew more about where we were going, what we were going to do, than we did. And it, it was really was amazing. They really did an excellent job of trying to keep the mail uh, to all of the personnel, and this it was just wonderful to get mail. That's such a build-up for morale that they've always oh, yes. insisted yeah. that but, that but, but, is when a priority. We were, but uh, yes, mm -hmm. but that they would be there before we were. <laughs> amazing. It was amazing back then, I think. Hmm. Well, it was um, three years of experience. And I forget so many things. After 60 years, you don't really remember all the things that um, went on. We did have a fire aboard ship one time that we had to uh, put out. Mm. And uh, that was kind of scary. I should think so. Was it handled well? Is it handled quickly? You mean the fire? Yeah. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. That's one of the things aboard uh, a ship that you dread more than anything is a fire, and you're constantly uh, practicing. Mm -hmm. Fire control. Fire control, yes indeed. Can you think of any reason that, uh, anything else you'd like to tell us about that you feel is connected with your part of the service? Well. Your, time in the service, I know you. Well, as I said, I thoroughly, enjoyed, I thoroughly enjoyed my temporary duty in Los Angeles. That was wonderful. You did mention meeting some movie stars. Tell, well, us, uh, tell us a famous what's movie. I've uh, forgotten. Um, Elizabeth Taylor? Yeah. I met Elizabeth Taylor at a nightclub and uh, talked to her a few minutes. And, but anyway, that was very interesting. We would go to dances at uh, the Palladium and the... Um, Did the locals bring out the girls to oh dance yes. with you? Oh, yes. USO? Yeah. Yes, indeed. They, at the USO, we thoroughly enjoyed that. And uh, it was good duty. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're glad you survived it as well as you did and well, came I'm, home I'm, safely. I'm, I am delighted safely. myself, yes. <laughs> and came home safely to, to us and we're glad you're here at Glen Eyre. Yep, I'm, I am too. And we thank you for your time and efforts. Well, This will go on tape and we'll talk to some other veterans and another. Well, I'm sure most, most of them uh, have somewhat similar experiences. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's all part of a uh, jigsaw. I mean, yeah. you're putting together facts and you may bring out something that someone else had completely forgotten. Mm -hmm. You know, and uh, it was a relief to sort of waste it, shall we say. <laughs> Use whatever you wanted. Use what you wanted, yes. Was it a great celebration when you heard the war was over? Oh, yeah. Yes, indeed. Oh, the place just went crazy. Uh, because we knew what we were headed for. That invasion had and, and we scared. knew, And we had an experience with the kamikaze uh, attacks at Okinawa. Mm -hmm. And so and we, and we knew that it was going to be even worse. The Navy had one bad, bad time at Okinawa with the kamikaze uh, attacks. Mm -hmm. They had uh, thousands of I don't know, uh, quite a few. 
chip sunk, damage, etc., and so forth. So. And you all escaped any yes, physical we damage? We did. We did, fortunately. 